London and Middlesex Archaeological Society holds history and archaeology talks on London's past every month. Check out our event listings on the website at www.lamas.org.uk. Thank you everybody, thank you for inviting me to talk to you about um, one particular aspect of our wonderful excavations at Bloomberg London we had. Um, you'll see that I've got notes here, copious notes, because there is Latin involved later on, and I don't do Latin, so I've got my notes with me. Um, but as I say, this is just one sort of small aspect of a huge assemblage of finds that were excavated from the Bloomberg London project, um, the vast majority of which, 99.4%, I think, were Roman in date. There was only a very tiny post-Roman and two prehistoric finds of uh, that whole huge record-breaking assemblage. So it's very much a Roman site, and it's very much a site about Roman London as well. Not just um, activity on the site itself, but activity across London more generally, and also even um, into the wider reaches of the empire, the Western Roman Empire in particular. Um, all of which we can tell and we can learn about through the writing tablets which we found on the site. So, starting um, where we are, um, obviously you all know where the city of London is, otherwise you wouldn't have made it here today. Um, and you'll all know as well, of course, that the city of London pretty much, today's city boundary pretty much reflects the, the line of the Roman city wall that goes around the Roman city as well. Um, the Roman city wall is later than the archaeology we'll be talking about today, but it's worth bearing in mind that um, the Bloomberg site is, is sat bang in the middle of, of the Roman city. Um, and it's a typical sort of bread and butter job for me in lots of ways and all my colleagues at MOLA. It's a development control project. We would, in the old days, have called it rescue archaeology. Some of us prefer to still maintain that um, terminology for it because obviously what we're doing is we are excavating archaeology in advance of the development of a site. So um, particularly on this site, um, some aspects of the site were very deep. Um, and that allowed us to go right to the bottom of the sequence. Quite often we had to stop halfway, which is always disappointing. In this instance, we were able to go right to the bottom and therefore the beginning of, of London, of Londinium. Um, Bloomberg, you'll all be aware, maybe are um, uh, an American media company. Ma um, Michael Bloomberg was the old mayor of New York when we first started on the project, and he's since now left um, the mayoral job and is now um, just a normal guy. Um, and uh, that he, he, at one point people said he should stand against Donald Trump how different would we be thinking about him if he had today but anyway how, quick, um, how soon things can change and he's now building or they're building their new European headquarters in London in the city of London they're moving from um, an office up here on Moorgate back down to the city and they're moving European people in which is kind of against the um, general flow of things as well um, but they are developing a site that some of you probably remember was looking um, like this, 1960s office block, Temple Court and Buckfisbury House that were on the site before. And it will look like this when it's built. Um, so this is the Warbrook building, this is the Rothschild building. There's a historic building there, you can just about see St. Susan's um, Church on Warbrook. Cannon Street Station is here. Um, and that's bank, obviously, on exchange up there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite low. Previous planning applications had it as a big high, a much higher building. But of <coughs> course, because it falls within the view of St Paul's from Blackheath in particular, um, it's low. Um, enough about the new stuff. This is talk about the old stuff now. Um, this is us again. This is us on site. So we're working underneath that um, little white roof in the corner there. That's the dome of St Stephen's Church that I showed you in the picture earlier, hidden behind the new building. And this is a picture taken in 2012, and obviously we're looking east towards the city. Um, I'm not going to talk about the history of the site in the 50s at all, particularly the Temple of Mithras, I wanted the site is famous for that, but that's another talk that you've probably already heard. Um, so we'll talk about um, the writing tablets in particular, but St Stephen's Church, which we just saw the dome of, um, is, in, is there. And that's a Wren church, one of Wren's um, first churches and, a, and the first dome that he constructed before obviously St Paul's was built. Um, and what we're looking at is the work in the 1950s after the war, um, the site was bombed heavily and it was cleared in advance of the redevelopment for the buildings we saw, the 1960s tower blocks we saw in the earlier slide. And what we're looking at um, is seven, eight metres roughly of Roman fill of the Warbrook stream. 
And what we're looking at now is we're, we're looking south along the line of the Warbrook stream towards the Thames. So the Thames is at the end of this photograph, behind those buildings. And on the left, this is where the Temple of Mithras was that had been excavated from in the couple of years prior to this photo being taken. And on the right-hand side, and um, from, from this point onwards, really, um, all the rest of the archaeology on site was removed by um, machinery and taken and, and dumped um, somewhere in the Thames Estuary. We know not where. But there's a good research project there for somebody. Um, so 95% pretty much was removed. And all we have left um, is all this on the left-hand side of the photo. You can see it's quite wet, though. The men have got wellies on. And that's um, of, of a key significance to the later survival of the archaeology on the site. This slide now, we're taking, with the previous picture we saw was taken from the vantage point of this person here. So um, we're still looking south, really, but we're looking at it from, from an angle, an oblique angle. Um, St. Stephen's Dome is on the left of this picture, but you can't see it. Um, and key to this photograph is the huge um, engineering um, logistics, really, I suppose, solutions that had to be instigated before we could dig down, because... The archaeology was so deep, we were going down 12, 14 metres below more than street level. And Warbrook and Bucklersbury, the streets either side of this photograph, are both medieval streets without anything um, substantial beneath them. And in fact, if you walk out of St Stephen's Church, as you come down the steps, you end up falling into the Warbrook Valley, um, in theory at least. So um, the ground is very unstable and we didn't want the church to fall in on us. So all these huge engineering props, they look like pipes carrying water, but they're just props to keep the road from falling in. <coughs> and I mentioned the Woolbrook. Um, here is the site in the pre-Roman pre period. This guy's come from Heathrow over his way. He's come on the way. Um, a... um, this is the site uh, in the pre-Roman period, as I say, and you can see that, that carving its way through the, the topography is the Woolbrook stream. Um, the fleet is the one in the north, and obviously Southwark is a series of yachts and islands at this point. Um, but the Walbrook becomes one of the main topographical features of the Roman town, certainly at this point. Um, but at this stage, it's a kind of shallow, wooded valley, really. Um, but it's carved over the millennia since um, it started to be formed. It's carved by a steep valley on one side and a shallow valley on the other side. And it runs through our site. And that means that the archaeology on this site is much deeper than you'd normally expect it to be in the city of London, and it's also much wetter. Both things are really good for preservation of things like writing tablets, obviously. So I just, I just put this slide in. This is the statistics on the left. But this is us um, looking at the piles carrying um, one of the Roman roads over the Walbrook Valley. And this is street level, so one, two, two and a half, maybe <coughs> three, three floors below modern street level. There's still bits of archaeology sticking into the... Um, into the gravels at the bottom of the Warbrook Valley. And the fact that as part of the development um, planning permission, uh, the Clever Old Corporation of London um, suggested that Bloomberg might like to provide um, for the public's benefit a new entrance into Bank Station um, Underground. Obviously, Bank Station is horribly overcrowded at rush hour, particularly the bits into the water and city line. Um, and, and on this site now, there's going to be a brand new um, escalators down into the Waterloo City Line, and that obviously is really deep. So we got to dig a whole um, seven metres deep of archaeology in advance of that piece of development. So the Romans arrive in London, and they live on the dry bits first, as any sensible um, people would do. And then slowly they need to um, encroach on the Albrook Valley. There's already a bridge carrying road one, which we call um, the main road east, um, west rather, through, through the city, um, really close to the site. Um, but they're still living in, the Walbrook Valley at this point is still quite steep and obviously quite un uninhabitable. Um, this picture down here, which you probably can't see, um, shows how the Romans dealt with this um, from an engineering perspective. And basically they, they built um, what we call cribs, but they're basically boxes, of oak timber, which is what these, these are behind. Um, and they build um, boxes and, and they fill the boxes with earth from, from around the town or from, from locally, just dug up. Um, and that creates a nice flat platform on which you can build a building. So what they're doing is, is reclaiming the land 
on the, the, the muddy, um, slippery slope of the wall brick and making it nice and flat for people to build houses on. And because it's, it's wet and deep, obviously we have the fantastic preservation of all the, um, of all the structural timbers that are involved within the construction of the cribs. This one has just become a bit um, <laughs> lashed by the weight of the 10 metres of modern or post-80 AD development above it, of course. Um, but you can see that the timbers in the background survive to a really high degree. And this is where the writing tablet story really starts, because in, in the material that they use to fill these cribs or these boxes with, um, it's included a lot of refuse from, from around the town. So people are carrying, are, are bringing carts um, of material along the road and it's organising the dumping to create these, these platforms. And a horrible site plan, I'm afraid, a draft site plan. This is the road at the top of the site and this is the wall brick here. And these are these boxes in pink um, with open areas behind them. Um, we didn't have the road sides of the buildings, obviously, because this is, we didn't dig there. That's, that's the actual street park, because our site starts here and goes down like this. But anyway, the, the pink bits are these, these cribs, boxes, structure numbers. And within all these structures um, are many, many writing tablets. Um, perfectly preserved because the ground is, is soggy and, and wet. And this is the first um, really... This is, these are the first contexts that we find these writing tablets within on our site. And these are really early. This, is, um, this isn't actually that early. It's 65 to 70 AD, but we had them in earlier structures from the sort of mid-50s on. So within 10 years of Roman occupation of Britain um, and within five years of Roman occupation of London, we've got these structures going up on our site and imported material coming in with things like writing tablets in it. And then, uh, obviously, because of, of where it is and because of the town is busy and bustling and things happen and, and people change and buildings collapse or burn down or whatever, um, they need to then build subsequent platforms on top of these. And we know that there was flooding in between some of these phases and some of the houses would have not been in a, in a good enough state to maintain. So in between phases of these um, platforms, they just import huge amounts of of stuff, again, from, uh, from around the town. And um, this is a pit, a later pit, with a fantastic basket in it. Again, that proves the, um, shows the organic um, preservation is really spectacular. Second century Roman basket. But um, he's, he's within a pit that's a metre and a half deep. And the metre and a half of material behind him is all this imported stuff from across Londinium. And it's very um, compacted because of the weight of things above. Um, and it doesn't move around very much, and it's wet. Um, so it, it, it provides an anaerobic environment, so no um, air gets in to deteriorate organic remains, and no um, air can get into rocked metalwork. So we have really spectacular survival of metalwork as well as organic remains, including um, the basket in the picture. So this is all by way of getting us to the point of where the writing tablets are, really, but... But by, this is um, for number one poultry, which is the, the site uh, directly over the road to us, and, and we're down here at this point. Again, I don't know where the guy with the boats come from. No evidence of that water being <laughs> navigable. But this is a pre-excavation pre um, reconstruction, so we're allowed. Um, and this is, this is how our site would have looked as well. We know from the activity behind the houses, although I said we didn't have the actual um, roadside bits of the property, we had enough behind to identify bakeries and administrative areas and domestic areas and kitchens, that kind of thing. And we can only assume, because it's on the main road, that the fronts of, house, of the buildings would have been shops and um, property selling things, providing services, whatever. And certainly the, the bakery, um, which we have, which is not, we haven't got a picture of bakery here, we had a really nice um, bake, bake from about 80 AD, and that would have been behind the bake shop, very obviously, because you're not going to be carrying. Um, baked bread very far. So this, this shows the environment within which um, people are living and using these writing tablets on and around our site. And all the, and this is, this is London in about 70 AD, like I say. So we've had, we've had the Boudicca uprising and the rebuilding after Boudicca. And this is London at its getting towards its height, really. I think the maximum 
Um, population for Roman London has been at, put at about, about 40,000 in about 100 AD, so we're heading towards that sort of apex of, of um, Londonian bustlingness, if that's a word, which it's not. Um, and all the other major writing tablet assemblages from Britain and across Europe are from late first century periods. Um, so we, we fit in with them um, quite nicely. And it ju that, that just goes to show you how important um, literacy was to the Roman culture, really, and the Roman culture that they brought with them, and how quickly um, it became part of London. So there are two um, types of, style, of, of tablet that you will find. One of them is um, ones where you write with ink, fairly obviously, and we have lots of evidence of ink wells from London, but only a few, very few um, ink stylus, inked tablets. Sorry, so this is an, an ink well, obviously, and you would just draw on a piece of wood um, with a a quill, a Roman equivalent of a quill, basically. Um, these are very common in the Vindolanda assemblages. You've probably all seen those fantastic ones which relate to the activity gain and around the fort on Hadrian's Wall, Vindolanda, and they, although it's a military site, lots of the, their tablets relate to the family and the domestic arrangements of the soldiers who lived in and around the fort. So um, Vindolanda, mainly ink, mainly military and associated. Um, the stylus tablets are the ones that we have. We have a couple of inks, I'll show you them in a minute. But the, the stylus ones are the ones that we have most of. Um, the, there would have been ink tablets in London. We have um, a known sort of concentration of, of ink wells, particularly in Samian ware, along the port and the waterfront in London. So there would have been um, much use of ink, presumably, in, in the trading and the other port activities, but we don't have the tablets because they don't survive. Um, we do have, these are the only wooden tablets that we have from our site. Um, and they were found together, and um, when they were found, we could see we had writing on. That is not a modern cut, I just hasten to add. They were in three bits when we found it. Um, and they, they were mainly used for correspondence. So like the, the military ones from Vindolanda, generally the ink ones are used for letters between people. Um, and the stylus tablets, which we'll look at in a second, are more likely to have been used for business or legal kind of transactions. So there's a, there's a difference between the usage of the two types. But our one, um, and it is the right way up, I promise. Uh, it just says, um, to his dearest brother, Januarius. Um, and that's unfortunately all we can read of this. But because of the tone of it, and because we know that generally they're used for correspondence, um, this is probably to fairly high-ranking chaps talking to each other, sending each other letters. Um, but the other type of tablet we have are these type. These, this is the, uh, obviously um, an example from a fantastic fresco in Pompeii. But you can see the lady, the woman has got um, one of these waxed tablets and she's got her stylus in her hand as well. Um, and the way that they were used um, is that you would have a piece of wood um, of varying types, and we'll see that in a second. Um, the front of which is sort of gouged out, really, to make a um, to leave an impression. And in the impression, you then put wax, um, black. Ours are um, beeswax, local beeswax, um, with charcoal to make it black. And then you would use your iron stylus to scratch your message in, and then you would fold it over, tie it up. You can see it's got um, leather binding to tie it, as you would a parcel. Um, and send it to the recipient who would reply uh, and send it back. Um, and we have, although we don't have many um, examples from, from London or Britain generally, obviously there's lots of evidence of these being used across the whole empire. They just don't survive, which is why, as I've said earlier, I was trying to overemphasize the preservation conditions and how lucky we were that we had all this deep, wet material that they were within, because without that we wouldn't have had them. Um, and the Romans, when they arrived in 43 AD, obviously fairly quickly, they, they, well, they brought with them straight away all the trappings of um, a, Roman, a Roman province would, would need. So legal um, structure, clerks to administer that, um, trading, merchants, people that spoke different languages, all the things that they need to administer a new province, which they then pretty much rapidly had in, in train. Um, and actually... Although in the Greek parts of the empire, um, the Romans adopted um, written Greek because they, they already had a written um, 
culture. In Britain, we didn't have a written culture before. We didn't, we didn't communicate by our writing. We had no evidence of it anyway. Um, so everyone had to adopt the Romanized way, which was the Latin, cursive Latin. Um, and it involves alcohol, of course, see, as all the <laughs> Roman stories do. Um, we know um, that our wooden writing tablets were mainly, predominantly used from reused barrel staves. So these are silver fir um, barrels all the way from the Alps. And they would have had, I think it's, it's either one ton or two tons of vaccina in each one. I can't remember, but either way, it's a little bit of the mouth. Um, and the, boot, the vaccine would have been drunk, obviously, and then um, the barrels would have been dismantled. And, and Damien Goodburn, who many of you will know, um, our ancient woodwork specialist, has, has showed us how exactly how to do this, how they would then plane down the barrels so they were really, really thin, um, cut them into um, recognised shapes. You can see the scale of, of Roger's hands here, how big that would have been, but it's kind of A5 size, really. Um, and then you would have a hole um, where you would hold, have your leather binding to, to hold the leaves together. And as I say, the wax um, in front, in, in the face. Uh, and associated with our tablets, because um, I, I don't I haven't said, but we previously we had about 50, I think, from London. And, and on the site, we found almost 400, only 150 of which have actually been translated properly for various reasons. Um, some of them didn't have any writing on at all. Um, but associated with them, in all the deposits that the tablets were in, we had um, writing implements, so styli, some really nicely decorated ones. Um, and also the spatula, which you would have used to wipe the wax clean when you've read the message, and then you could have written your response in the message and sent it off. So they're, they're reusable um, methods of communication. Much like iPads, someone said, really, it's the old iPad. Um, the most famous one uh, until now was the, the, um, the Fortunata writing tablet from Number One Poultry Over the Road. And you can make out the writing in this one. Um, the, the photos have to be taken from all angles, and there's a bit about that later on. But um, it's really hard to see the writing, obviously. But I can tell you that it's been translated by Roger Tomlin, who's the universal expert in it. And this um, tells the story of Fortunata, who was a slave girl from um, France and had been either sold in the slave market in London or had been sold in France and brought to London. And this relates to her, her deed of sale in the early 2nd century AD. And it's from stuff like this that we get names of people who lived here and activities and things, information or nuanced information about how the social strata of Roman society worked. Slavery is a, um, a, obviously a horrendous um, proposition for us. It was very much an accepted part of Roman society, as we all know. So um, it's from things like this that we get direct um, relation, really, with the, with the people who were here. Um, only one of ours had the beeswax surviving, um, and we sent it off for very, ex very expensive um, analysis. And it came back and said, yeah, it's beeswax. <laughs> and, yeah, it's got tarpaul in it. I'll leave that up there so we get our money's worth. <laughs> um, there's just, th just two types, really. Um, the, the main type that, we, that most of ours were is the ones I've just described. So the face is, is gouged in, and then you can turn it over. And, and the address is on the front, so the back of this and you'd write your message here, and you would fold it over, and, and you'd write your address on the front of the tablet. Um, and here he is. This is Roger Tomlin, who works, who, um, works in Oxford University, and he um, was responsible for doing the epigraphy, the translation of all our tablets. And he is one of the very few cursive Latin experts left, um, or have ever existed, actually. Um, there's not there's not many of them around. There's um there's Alan Bowman who did the Vindolanda ones and there's Roger. Um, pretty much it. Um, and it, and it's very much an art form. It's not so much a scientific process. Um, it's a lot of interpretation of different people's handwriting. If you've ever, ever done any marking of essays or looking at children's <laughs> books, you'll know that that is um, again can be quite challenging. So these are the main, the, the most common um, letter forms used in our tablets. And this is 
uh, first century curse of Latin. And you'll see what he's done. Need it in Bloomberg up here. Um, <laughs> some letters don't exist in, in this alphabet. Obviously, there's no Y, there's no J. Um, the I um, makes the sound of J. Um, and actually, it's, it's lucky we didn't have any later ones because the curse of Latin script changes sometime in, I think, the late second century. So he has to, um, the date and the chronology of the, of the finding of these things is quite important as to which alphabet he looks at. And he tells a really good story about somebody who found one famously and decided it was a terrible curse tablet. And then when someone else came and looked at it again, they just turned it up the other way and it was something entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have to be very careful. Um, but hopefully you'll all know what that says. Um, but the, the key thing is, though, is that there's... Um, so these are all, this is the alphabet on the top, and this is um, all our numbers of, of some of the legible tablets. And these are all the different ways all the different people wrote those particular letters. So the handwriting, as I say, can be quite challenging to decipher. And as well as that, um, you have the issue that they were often reused. So as I said earlier, quite often you would, um, you would scrape out the message that your friend had sent you, and you would write your response on the same, do the same piece of wax that you've just made smooth, um, and what happens, obviously, is that you, if we are lucky as archaeologists, the stylus goes deep enough into the, through the wax to etch onto the wood underneath, and that's how we get this fantastic um, evidence left. But if many people have used the same thing, we get something that looks a bit like this. Um, and this is just one of the many that he had that, um, that, are really, that were really challenging to him, and until somebody... There's all sorts of um, ideas about how technology could help with this kind of thing. But unless, to, um, and Roger does think that it would be useful to have technology, certainly if you could find some way of measuring with um, beams the different depths of the writing, you could, you could identify five or six or two or three different, different sets of writing in the same one. Um, this one, uh, so this is imp up here. And I have a translation, you'll be glad to hear. So um, this is a, a dated imperial do uh, official in document, presumably. We've only got the um, half of it, so maybe the date was on the other half. But it's, it's too Bellinus. Um, but he, this is all that we've got, which is really quite um, taunting, because he's asking him angrily for something or to do something else, and we can't, Roger can't get any further into that one, apparently. Um, but we are doing more work on some of them, which I'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so let's get into some of them then. Um, so you'll see that um, this is how I'm going to show you on the slide. So, so this is the actual tablet. You can see the scratches maybe um, and how the, the stylus is bobbled in through the, through the pith of the wood. Um, and then this is Roger's drawing. Um, there's a word there that you might be able to recognise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here it is in Latin, but I don't. I do have it in English as well, uh, and I'll read it if you like. Can everyone see it? Shall I read it? In the in the consulship of Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, for the second time, and of Lucius Calpurnius Piso on the sixth day before the Ides of January, which is translated um, into modern parlance as the eighth of January, AD fifty seven. I, Tabulus, the freedman of Venustus, have written and say that I owe gratis the freedman of Spurius 105 denarii from the price of the merchandise which has been sold and delivered. <coughs> this money I am due to repay him or the person whom the matter will concern. So there's loads of interesting things in there. There's the fact that they're both freed men, so they were slaves and now they've bought or been given their freedom. Um, we have really fantastic references to money, and that, so that's quite a lot of money, actually, 105 denarii at this stage. This is early, this is 57 AD, um, and at that point, that's what, that's six months of, a, of an average soldier's wage at this point. So there's a lot of money that's being lent um, in Londinium. But the, the most important thing about this one, of course, is the date. Um, AD 57, um, this makes it the earliest dated document from Britain. Um, because we have no written Roman uh, references that, that predate this one. So this is a really um, quite an important little thing. And we've only got half of it, um, but the details are, are quite good on this one, actually. There's far worse ones, you'll see them in a minute. 
Um, that's why that is a historically important document. And that one will be displayed in the new building when they have the exhibition of finds. That one will be up there. You can have a look at that. Okay, um, number 45 um, is again quite early, so 62. Um, and you can see um, we have more of it, although we only have half. They sort of snap um, in half, but we've got the half of one. Uh, again, we've got more dates and... Um, we've got this, Londinium here, of course. Uh, this says, in the consulship of Publius Marius Celsus uh, and Lucius Alfinius Gallus on the 12th day before the calends of November, which is the 21st of October, AD 62. Um, I, Marcus Renius Venistus, have written and say that I have contracted with Gaius Valerius Proculus that he bring from Verulanium. By the Ides of November, 20 loads of provisions at a transport charge of one quarter denarius for each, which is not, um, not much money, considering we've just talked about how 100 denarius is six months' wage, um, on condition that one adds to London, uh, and then it he sort of loses it then. Um, but this, of course, is really important, because it, we have um, London and we have Berlin in the same um, uh, piece of text, same archaeological... Um, evidence. And it's, it's important because of the date, again, 62 um, is maybe a year after the Bootham um, Rebellion, which would have raised um, London and Berlin, St Albans, and Colchester to the ground, pretty much, we know. Um, and within a year, London is getting provisions from Berlin, which is, is significant um, to historians of Roman Britain, as well as archaeologists of Roman London, obviously. Um, and the, the names, again, are, are full and really, really nicely detailed, but it's, it's the fact that this proves that there was rebuilding going on within a year, or probably a year, maybe a little bit longer, of the, of the huge um, chaos that ensued after Bibi could raise London to the ground. And there had been an assumption that it maybe would have taken five, six, up to ten years, bits of London to recover. And this suggests that actually we're already, they were already on it pretty damn quick. After, um, after the dust had settled, really, quite literally that. So this, again, is a really important historical document, as well as a really nice archaeological artefact. And there's another one, which I haven't got a slide of, which is from 64 AD, um, again, quite soon after the Boudicca Rebellion, really, which talks about um, there having been a rapid recovery in settled conditions in London, which is a really nice, pithy statement which says that by that point everything, you know, don't worry guys, we're, we're getting back to where we were. And we know that by 70 AD, London was, was on the up, um, had been on the up for a while. So this is a really nice um, proof of what, of what archaeologists have thought perhaps. Um, this is a nice one because it, um, it relates to Britain as a whole. Tertio, Brachia, Rhea are Tertio is the man's name. His name is Tertius, and brachia is an odd word that probably means brewer. Um, Roger thinks it means brewer. The other guy that does writing tablets thinks it means maltster, but, uh, maltster. but either way, it's something to do with beer. Um, and this is interesting because Tertius is known to have been at Vindolanda. He's mentioned in the Vindolanda tablets, and um, there is obviously, um, there's only one of him, because it's to him and he's the brewer, and it has no other um, address or anything. And there are other tablets that relate very, um, very specifically to the supply of beer as well to Londinium, which is really great. We have that from Roman mm -hmm. London. But the fact that um, there is communication, it comes as no great surprise, I suppose, really. But at this point, obviously, Vindolanda was on the, the edge of the Roman Empire, and, Lo and London was in contact with it and through um, brewing. Um, another one which is really nice, which is fairly obvious really, and I haven't got, I don't bother with the translation for this, because um, Landinio Mogontius, um, um, Mogontio here, but Mogontius is the sort of translation really, and this is an address, um, the top of a, a snapped off tablet book, where you have the name of the town and the name of the chap, and he is Mogontius and he lives in Londinium. And this is late first century again, I think this is um, early 70s AD. And the, the crucial thing about this is Mogontius is a, is a native of British name. So he is 
Um, he didn't come over with the Romans. He, he moved into a Roman town, um, like me, really, as an economic migrant from the provinces. <laughs> Probably like lots of you as well. Um, and this is, it's quite nice to have um, evidence of other populations coming into London who had already lived in Britain and who, and who were ha relatively, presumably happy to come and take advantage of the, of the thriving town. And the shortness of the address um, is quite important as well because it's, there's no address really, it's just him in London. And that would um, suggest that whoever's writing to him knows him, so there's a there's quite a, um, a high level of um, a recognition between the population at this point. There's probably only one Magontius, basically. That's, that's the point of it. Um, and all the examples from our tablets have, have short addresses like this. Um, so the old asterisk joke about number six um, Cannon Street is, is, is not right, actually. <laughs> most, of the, um, most of our examples have things like um, to Brooke Ellis, who lives opposite the Cooper, things like that. Um, so they're all quite short and, and like I say, they denote um, a really close communication between lots of different parts of the Roman town. Uh, it's quite a local correspondence, as well as um, correspondence that goes further, like we just saw with the Vindolanda example, the brewer. So this one um, is a good one. Um, there you go. You, you can recognise form from that. This one was addressed on the front, which I'm not showing you a slide of, but on the front it's addressed to Titus, who was a poultry keeper. And I've forgotten the name for poultry keeper in Latin, but um, it's a nice job for someone to have, I guess. Titus, the, the chicken man. <laughs> um, and this, this is really early. This is um, pre-53 AD, so this is from the very beginning, again, first decade of Roman London, really. And it's addressed to somebody, as I say, the addresses are short, so it's whoever it was, new Titus. And they are giving him some hassle. They are saying, because they are boasting through the whole market that you have lent them money, therefore I ask you not to appear shabby, you will not thus favour your own affairs. <laughs> and it seems that Titus has been warned by somebody else that unless he sorts this loan out that he's still owed, he's, he's going to end up with egg on his face, quite literally. Um, <laughs> and, well, wasn't that better than I hoped? Um, and the forum, the forum um, reference needn't be actually the forum in London, the forum facility that we know was on... Um, Leadenhall, Eastern Hill, all that. It could be that it's forum in Gaul, um, that it's it's not a British market, um, or it could be actually that it's more of a saying. So you'd say the whole town's talking about you, and of course it's actually only people in the pub. But um, it's that kind of thing. So the idioms and the the um, the Latin chat really is adopted. This is pre fifty three. So as as I say, it, it's very quickly become a Roman. Um, a Latin-speaking community. Um, this is another similar one. This still come up at once. That was a bad one. Sorry. Okay. So um, this on the front was addressed to Atticus. We don't know what his name, his job was, but he was Atticus anyway. And this is another one that uses idioms. Really, I ask you by bread and salt that you send as soon as possible the twenty-six denarii in Victoriati and the ten denarii of Paterio. Now, there are numismatists here, so I'm really reluctant to get into this. <laughs> but um, Victoriati, by this point, are an old, um, old-fashioned, out-of-date type of currency. Um, and denarii are very much um, used. Now, if, if this person really was asking Atticus to send the Victoriati, then he would have had to go and ask his, um, his mother, if she still had any, maybe, or he would have to look in his cupboard in his kitchen to see if he had any of these. It's like nine... Um, ten bob, basically. That's that kind of that kind of language. So we all we all know what a bob is, but none of us have them. Um, and the the bread and salt again is another um, is another sort of pithy saying, really. So it's it's the equivalent, perhaps, of, of a kind of a free lunch thing. I did you a favour. I, I bought you lunch, and now you've got to send me the money you owe, please. Um, and all the other money that you owe, Paterio as well. So this, again, is someone who is um, being hassled for money. Uh, and th they're very much along the vein of um, legal or financial transactions. Like I say, there's not one that has a personal note on it at all. Um, another thing that we did have uh, on the site, in, amongst the finest images, was lots of evidence of the Roman military. 
Um, as I say, um, with the tablets, they came from all around the town to be dumped on our site. So we can't say that the military were living on our site, that there was a fort there or anything. But we know that they were um, really common in, in London generally um, in the late mid to late first century AD. It was exactly what you would expect if you just landed in a province and were trying to establish a town and then somebody came and burnt it down. You'd probably want to keep your, your army close to hand. Um, and this is another type of tablet that we have. So these are legal documents. So, so there's two um, impressed um, bits that would have had wax in. And in the middle um, is where you would have put your seal. And these are witness, witnessed documents. So some of them are legal, some of them relate to financial transactions again. Um, and this is interesting because they are cavalrymen. So um, the Curians are mounted... Um, mounted army, mounted cavalry, basically. Um, and, and we know that they were, um, as I say, all over um, the town because we have lots of evidence of them on our side. Interestingly, with this one and the next one, um, this is another set of witnesses. The handwriting's all different, so they all wrote their own name. A cavalry, when we can assume, are probably fairly um, highly educated, relatively highly educated, um, and predominantly came from the the, um, the mounted regiments who'd, regiments, cohorts, legions who'd fought along the Rhine, so had been fully um, Romanized for some time, really. This is, again is another loan note, and this tells us what troop they're in. So um, I don't know how to pronounce that. Longinus, Longinus, Agrippa, and Vericundus are all um, the troops of Sylvanus. Uh, and these would either have been mounted cohorts, so parts of legions, or they may have been um, perhaps as part of the governor's mounted um, guard by this point. This is a nice one. Um, I didn't bother with translation because it's fairly obvious. This is capitals as well, which is really interesting. Um, far more like our, our capitals. And when we first saw it, we wondered if it was somebody teaching a child to write because of the dots. But actually the dots are only because that's where the soft bits of the wood are, so the stylus goes in and penetrates in further. Um, but somebody's practicing writing, and um, I think we think that the, the, the amount that we had within a relatively small um, area really um, sort of indicates the ubiquitousness of um, writing in London, really, certainly in the, well, throughout the whole Roman period, but we've got evidence of it from the late first century. So we can say that, that writing was, was everywhere, would have been used by lots of people across all sectors of society. Um, and this is, um, this is just A to L, but we had about 100 names, 100 people named specifically on tablets. Um, all of them have got fantastic um, Roman names, as you would expect, Roman names. Um, and they also <coughs> mention a lot of the time their job. Now this is a bad example, um, no it's not, it's not such a bad example, There's, most of them have got good jobs, the chaps on here, emperors, consulates, um, and um, horsemen, um, and the other, um, M to Z has um, other emperors and things and that's their number as well. Um, there's also amongst them, although they're not mentioned in terms of their um, profession necessarily, but as I said, there's poultry keepers, there's brewers, there's a cooper, um, there's a guy who was a haulier who had who owned carts and drove uh, carts for a living. He would have been transporting stuff, and that's why people would have had to give him money because he was he was the Pickfords of the late first century AD. Um, key to this though is that there's no women amongst any of these names. There are a hundred names, not a single female name mentioned, and that's pr well, it is due to the um, environment that, that they relate to. So they relate to business and legal and commercial transactions. And in the Roman period, women didn't, um, they may have been involved in those really closely, but they didn't have, there was no recognition of their involvement. Um, so your husband, you might have worked for, well, you would have obviously worked for your husband in his shop, but your contribution would not have been um, recognised to something that happened. And same with the children as well. So... Um, that's why there's no women, which is a bit of a shame, but again, like I say, it relates very much to the, fun to the function of these. Um, the Vindolanda ones, which have mothers and sisters and daughters and wives and whatever mentioned, were much more personal. These are all commercial, business, legal, speak. 
And you can see that from the relationships as well, father of, son of, etc., etc. And the, the other, the last thing to mention is the slaves. So um, there's slaves of, there's lots of freedmen amongst them. And um, Roger makes the point that the slavery um, issue, although everyone in London, or most people in London, would have been aware of writing and would have been aware of the need to be literate, they wouldn't all have been literate, of course, by any stretch of the imagination. So what would have had to happen is you would have had to employ someone to, to write or read or communicate via writing on your behalf. Um, and that's perhaps where the slaves come in. Some of them would have been quite highly educated scribes and they would have done, done the writing. They are still slaves, but they were, um, they were educated ones. Um, so I've, I've talked about how all the tablets come from all across London and how all the information contained therein relates to London really um, on a nice general level. There, of course, is one exception to prove that rule. Um, another horrible, horrible site plan, but this is the road again. This is the Walbrook stream here. Um, building 9, which you can't see because this is a temple slide. Building 9, um, the back room of Building 9. So these are the um, timber bases for the walls. You can see the holes in the timber bases where the uprights would have stood. Um, and this is the beaten earth floor of, of this room of Building 9. And within this room, there were 19 writing tablets, which is, um, which is really, really unusual for the project. Only 10% of the whole 400-odd came from um, layers that we can identify as being relating to occupation. So a floor, um, part of a building, everything else came from dumps or um, other sorts of huge, these make-up um, land reclamation deposits. But most of the ones that didn't came from Building 9. Um, and some of them had um, evidence that they were used for legal um, records, they were legal documents. Some of them were blank, so maybe they were, they were there ready to be used. And of course, um, that has been now the christened London's first office, of course, much to Bloomberg's joy. Um, but, but, I mean, you know, all jokes and laughing aside, it is actually really significant that we had an assemblage in that tiny room there. And if all this... Um, economic commercial activities going on up here, of course there would have been somebody in the background recording all the, all the numbers, and that's exactly what. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you can identify a function for a room in a Roman building, and I think we can maybe say it for that one. <laughs> Only maybe, though, of course. Okay. Um, and here they are, all nestled up um, against the timber wall, under excavation there. So there were not... Um, we're nearly there now. That, that they weren't um, all... This is blank, unfortunately. This is a label um, for something, some goods or sack of stuff. Out for had this around its neck. Uh, unfortunately, there were no, there was no writing on that, and there were lots of them that had no writing on, but we could see. Uh, and there were others that had, like I say, this um, really confusing mishmash of many different types of writing, many different types of handwriting on them. Um, so what we're doing. Um, we're doing further photography of them in an attempt to try and tease out more information from the ones that we've looked at and ones that we haven't, Roger couldn't see with his naked eye, basically. Um, so there's a big, this isn't it actually, but it looks a bit like it, there's a big dome um, of lenses over them currently up at Mola and, and we're taking um, photographs of them from all different angles so that you can see the difference um, in depth of scratching and the difference in shadow from the light, hoping to identify much with some more clarity, um, the different writing and see if we can get further into this amazing assemblage of things. And if you'd like to know more, you can buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this talk, perhaps you'd like to join our society. Our memberships start from £6 a year for students and £20 a year for individuals and includes a free copy of our transactions publication. See www.lamas.org.uk forward slash join hyphen lamas.html for more details.